Okay, the reading for this week is Santo Kyoden's Sharebon, titled Nishiki no Ura, translated by Korniki as A Brothel in the Light of Day, The Other Side of the Brocade. I'll have a link to Korniki's translation in the description below, and a link to the original Japanese text, and I will also make a study guide and put the link to that in the description as well. And yesterday, I should mention, I made a a video of a recitation video of this work with a lot of extended commentary as I read and it ended up being 90 minutes and the moment I pushed the stop button on the camera the video disappeared and I think it was because the video was too long so in this video I want to uh, make it as short as possible so I'm not going to give any commentary I will make a separate video that uh, goes over the study guide to this work and in the study guide I will talk about Santo Kyoden give some, uh, uh, brief description of the author Santo Kyoden, uh, some description of the historical context, the Kansei Kaikaku or Kansei reforms that are sort of important historical background to this work. I'll talk about the genre of the Sharebon and the larger uh, genre of Gesaku or playful fiction, playful writing that was very popular in the Edo period as well and some other uh, important elements. So all of that will go in the second video. This is going to be simply the recitation of the work as translated by Kornicki, as brilliantly translated, I should say. This is, a very, this is an excellent translation. All right. A brothel in the light of day, the other side of the brocade. Preface. One day, Tsuta no Karamadu, Okay, there's a note about him, it's Taya Juzaburo, the famous publisher in the Edo period. One day, Tsuta no Karamadu, the bookseller, came and asked me if I'd got plans for any more of my little books. Like that fool Donin in the play, I replied, there are plenty more to, cl to come, and went and committed myself without another thought. Well, I, hardly, I had hardly taken up my brush to write when I found that what I didn't have was money and good ideas. After all, these worthless brownbacks pick out the same things year in and year out and carry the same plots year in and year out. So I've twisted things around a bit and come up with a brand new idea, a book describing what a brothel is like in the light of day. And that's a far cry from its glamorous appearance at night. Hoping that this is an original plot, I've called the book Nishiki no Ura, The Day People Saw the Ryukyuans Enter Edo. Signed, Santo Kiku Kyoden. Okay, this is the preface that he gives to this book, emphasizing the fact that it's the reality of the licensed quarters of the pleasure district and not the fantasy that is usually depicted in other Sharebon. So from the start, he, uh, he, he distinguishes this work from other Sharebon. And I should mention that he wrote uh, nine or ten important Sharebon that I'll talk about in the second video. This is one of his uh, more well-known, one of his masterpieces of the genre. Okay, so he starts with the preface, which is kind of directed at the uh, government officials who had cracked down in the Kansei reforms on licentious fiction, on um, the works that they considered vulgar and had censored or banned a lot of works and arrests, were starting to arrest um, writers around this period. So he's saying to them, uh, this has a moral a purpose. Take that into account when you read this and please don't ban my work. Is basically the purpose of that preface. And the following postscript he includes as well. I recite. Sang Yu, the Chinese poet, wrote an amorous poem to warn against passion. And Murasaki Shikibu told a sensual story in 54 chapters to warn against lust. There is really no difference between their writings and Buddhist parables. Although it may seem that I have often written worthless books that are concerned only with debauchery, I have never forgotten to give that, some warning, that same warning. And when depicting the human emotions of joy, anger, sadness, and pleasure, I have done my best to encourage virtue and reprove vice. Underline this phrase, encourage virtue and reprove vice. In Japanese, it's kanzen chowaku, a very important phrase uh, that has to do with didactic literature, right? The idea that a literature should have a didactic purpose, namely the encouraging of virtue and the reproving of vice. To take a familiar example, it is like using sweets to coax a child or moxa to warn it against something. In other words, the sweets are a parable, and the moxa is benevolence, righteousness, and the rest of the five virtues. So he's basically saying that his work, it might have some sort of seedy or licentious elements, 
But in the end, it is a sort of Buddhist ho ben, right? A uh, expedient means for teaching virtue, the Confucian virtues, and for teaching uh, Buddhist ideas as well. So it is sure, surely so it surely cannot be said that the words didactic reading matter on the cover of this book are there without reason. Readers are requested to judge the matter favorably. Okay, that's the end of the postscript, and now he begins the work. So he's basically saying to please do not ban this work, and please do not arrest me for writing this. Is purpose okay? The other side of the brocade. A crow at three o'clock in the morning. Caw, 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 caw. A morning bell. Dong, 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 dong. The sound of pulp hammer. Tap, 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 tap. A trader's cry. Fried bean curd, fried bean curd. As it says in the Michiyuki in Shinde Yaguchi no Watashi, if, I, if only I could have been born in the land where day never dawns and have stayed there forever and ever. This is an apt rendering of the human feeling of love. Urashima's casket and trick glass boxes may have lots of room inside, but when opened, they only bring regrets. Okay, I should mention it. That there are many, many footnotes in this text that you will be reading in English, so make sure you read all those. I'm not going to discuss them, but they are uh, essential to understanding this work. So I'm just going to read the text. When day opens to lovers part with regrets, and for centuries now that feeling has been the subject of poems in Chinese and Japanese, linked verses, lenga, jōruri, songs, sermons, preachers' addresses, and evening lectures. It has been gone over time and time again to the point of repetition. So it is now to the millions of people in China and Japan, even to old men who have never been in a covered boat except for funeral services for the drowned, and even to old women who have never seen a puppet play except for those about Nichiren. It may be foolish of me to go over it all again now, but as far as fireworks shops and brothels are concerned, the light of day is one thing the world could well do without. The light of day is one thing the world could well do without. And then stage directions here in the boxes. Now, a long time ago, in the august reign of Emperor Go Ichijo, there was a brothel in the Kanzaki Pleasure Quarter, Kawabe District, Setsu, and it belonged to Yoshida, Yoshidaya Kizaimon. Okay, so he's setting this uh, work in the distant past rather than the contemporary world, uh, as is common in other Shalebon, in order to make some sort of distance between himself and his world and the world of the work, in order to avoid um, censure and censorship and banning and getting, possibly getting arrested. Okay? So it's important to point out that it takes place in the distant past. And uh, continuing... Uh, the scene one morning there, okay, so here too, this is the narrator speaking. So keep in mind that there's a narrator who walks you through the work as if he's a kind of cinema verite, French director of the 1960s making films. It kind of just walks around this world of the pleasure quarters, introducing you to various characters and settings and so forth without much emphasis or focus on a uh, constructed plot. So there's not much of a plot here in the story until the very end of the work. We see uh, what's his face come in. At that point, the last few pages have something resembling a plot, but other than that, it's just this narrator walking you around, uh, introducing you to the world of uh, the, the uh, pleasure district. Right? And the narrator, Shadebon, in general, are very uh, conversation or dialogue heavy, but this work has probably 30% narrative, right, or narrator speaking, right, all in the present tense, I should add. He speaks in the present tense as if you're being given a tour of the pleasure quarters, right? But all the other 70%, I would say, is uh, conversations between the char various characters. The narrator continues. The scene one morning there on the second floor. Okay, so he's taking his camera. Obviously, cameras don't exist, but he's taking his camera to the scene and describing it for you. The scene one morning there on the second floor. Drink stands all over the place and tea bowls piled on top top of small trays on the lacquered tables in the corridor. It's just like the pile of stools on which a peddler might make a show of drawing a sword in order to sell his wares. To one side, under rings of orange peel, two broken chopsticks lie where there were thrown where they were thrown. How's that for a misty moon? There are as many bits of paper lying around as there would be on the offertory table in the bathroom on a festival day, 
as many straw slippers lined up as you would expect at the way into Nyogo Island. And vomit is scattered around the lavatory like fallen flowers. Underline vomit there. This is not the world of, of uh, the pleasure quarters at night, which is uh, a fantasy world. This is the real world, world that has vomit left over the next day, right, after the festivities are, and the reveling is finished. With only a few glowing embers left, the brazier in the supervisor's room is almost out. Rows of letters wait at the bottom of the stairs, and there is a he heap of salt by the door. The trinkets in the junior's hair are all awry, and the apprentice's forelocks have all slipped sideways in disarray. Apprentices appears a lot. These are the apprentice geisha, the young geisha who is still in training, uh, studying under an, uh, an elder, an older geisha. <clears throat> they have slept long, but have been on their backs a while as well. Last night's devastating beauty is this morning's unrivaled hag. Okay, so the beauties of the night and the fantasy world of drink and uh, darkness are revealed to be not so pretty during the day, right? All is revealed at dawn. Slight pockmarks on the nose, scars on the necks, and to Katsudagi's sorrow, receding hair. So anybody who's been to the pleasure quarters in Japan, you still see this today if you go out for a night of drinking. The next day, things do not look so pretty. Um, so morale is low all around, but here is in the midst of it all is Yugiri, underline Yugiri, she's the main character of this work. The senior girl at the Yoshidaya and an oiran by rank. The oiran is the highest ranking of the geisha. There's a note about the oiran. She is at the peak of her career as Kanzaki's best, and her brilliance is such that it will not fade alongside even the Menya's polished wooden dolls or those lustrous jewels that shine even at night. Yu Giri has evidently just got back after seeing a guest off as far as the tea house. Oh, I'm so cold! And she goes upstairs. Sorane, a junior geisha, is behind her, looking rather cold. The ends of her hairdo are tied in place with paper. She brings in Yugiri's clogs and her own as well. Oh, I think the sanitary man's just been. It really stinks. In the corridor, the night watchman is cleaning some paper lanterns he has lined up in a row. Yugiri. Okay, I'll say the name and then their, uh, their lines. Yugiri. Look, Kisuke, your foot's bleeding. What happened, night watchman? I caught myself on a nail that was holding a decoration onto a tray of food, miss. Yugiri. Nasty. Narrator. Yugiri goes into one of the rooms and takes a sip of some water warming in a pot over a fancy brazier. It tastes of copper, so she pours the rest away and scratches around inside the brazier. Sodane, there's probably some tin cinders left downstairs, so could you go get me some, please? Sodane says yes and goes downstairs. Yugiri, Yugiri looks around and then opens the door into the wardrobe in the next room a few inches and pokes her head in. It must be really embarrassing for you in there. She has hardly spoken when she hears the supervisor's voice, so she quickly slides the door shut. The supervisor soon appears. Good morning, Yugiri. Yugiri leans against the door and tries to look unconcerned. Look, isn't it going to be a lovely day? Super supervisor. Can't you see the clouds? I got ever so tired yesterday, you know. Yugiri begins to relax. Was it really packed at Horino Uchi then? Supervisor. Yes, I got them to hang up our offering towel towels as soon as I could and came straight back. Yugiri. Thank you for doing that for me. Just look, will you? Yofune is fast asleep. Supervisor. So she is. Looking around the supervisor, she sees Kawatake. Underline Kawatake, another character. Underline each character as they appear. Kawatake, who is meant to be on duty, sleeping curled up inside a stone that looks rather the worse for wear. Beside her, Yofune and another junior geisha, Ashikano, are sleeping directly on the tatami floor. With stone over their heads and pillows adrift, they, the look, they look like the dead. Supervisor. These girls are only any good at showing off. I've only got to tell them to go and see to a guest, and oh, they don't want to do, they don't want to, and it's such a nuisance for them. Yugiri. Did you know that they've even started taking, talking in their sleep now? Though I can't understand what they say. Supervisor. How stupid. At this point, Sorane brings in some live coals in a box. 
Things have been noisy in the corridor for some time now. A number of juniors have captured a guest. Guest. Shut up, everybody. I don't want this to go around. Nabezudu, a senior geisha. Rubbish. It takes two to sin, as everybody knows. Guest. Oh, I feel dizzy. Udemaki, a junior geisha. Thanks to you, we've been crouching outside in the cold since before dawn. Koikaze. What nerve. I suppose you were the first outside. With everybody shouting at once, they make their way along the corridor, taking the guest with them. The junior geishas aren't really serious about it, but the guest is like a dragonfly caught in a spider's web. He makes a great fuss, loses his wits, finds his hoods fallen aside, and then gives in and is taken to Guchisato's room on the second floor at the back. The clock in the office strikes eight. The juniors dress him up in an old kimono that's part of their uniform and gather around him like small birds attacking an owl, chatting and teasing him. Udemaki, sorry, no smoking. Nabezudu, I'm going to make you a priest now, so you have to do you up. I have to do you up. Koikaze, I wonder what sort of priest would suit you best. Udemaki, you'll, just, you'll be just like a beggar priest, I think. Nabezudu, how do you like that then? I've made you the spitting image of a priest. Udemaki and Koikaze, not bad. Udemaki, how I hate it, that tea house now. The other day I tore down their shop blind and came home. Tea house chaya is a, so usually uh, involves some sort of prostitution. Keep in mind as you read this, nabe zede, and they are so rude as well. Koikaze, they might as well close down all the brothels around here. Nabe zede, koikaze, I left my clogs in front of Takemura's. Would you go and get them, please? What on earth can you giddy be doing? Koikaze. Oh, she went and fell in a ditch in Nichome. So she's just washing her feet downstairs. Hey, you scratched me. Look, I'm bleeding. Udemaki. If you go and tear my sleeve, I'll get another telling off from the sewing girls. While they have all been talking at will, the guest has been keeping quiet. He's in a minority. Then in comes Guchisato, an oiran geisha, with, her, with a haughty air about her. Damn it, be quiet, the lot of you. You, you're no guest of mine, and until you can learn to be more considerate to me, you'd better do something about your manners. They're disgusting. She doesn't stop at that either. The, other, the owner of the tea house does all she can to calm her down. She's got all sorts of things with her, from bedding at the most expensive to clothes at the cheapest. Gifts, it seems, to make up for what's happened. In the next room, a senior, is, a senior geisha is gargling in front of her mirror. She seems to have just gotten up. Then Tsunaji, an apprentice geisha, comes down, up from downstairs. Over a padded uniform kimono, which is so dirty that it shines with a black luster. So no dirt again, right? This is very different from the world at night. The dirty next day. She has tied a narrow sash with a faded, pa faded pattern. She keeps rubbing and rubbing her eyes and looks as though she is still half asleep. Kurumai. Is that Tsunaji? Tsunaji, yes. Yes, Kurumai, you've come just for at the right moment. Let me a pipe, light me a pipe, will you? Tsunaji answers, yes. But as there is no fire in the room yet, she goes to the supervisor's room to light it. Kurumai, ah, blast, it's gone out. She is hitting her pipe on the floor when a tea house boy comes hurrying up. Excuse me, miss, I think Mr. Ase left his tobacco pouch behind. Kuruma, Kurumai, Perhaps it's among the bedclothes. Go and have a look, boy, yes. And after a quick search, here it is, miss. Kurumai, is he still at your place? Boy, yes, miss. He hurries away again to be followed by a tea house girl. Excuse me, miss, but could you bring your letters out, please? Kurumai, is anyone going today? Girl, we'll send someone. Kurumai, oh, if you'll just wait a minute then. By the way, have you got any of that melon pickle left? Girl, yes, we've got some. Would you like some? Kurumai, well, why don't you go and get some while I'm writing my letters, if you don't mind? Downstairs, the shop blind is hanging half rolled up. It has Yoshidaya printed on it in bold strokes, dark blue on a red background. Nearby, an apprentice is sitting on the raised platform at the entrance and looks as if she is about to fall off. She is playing with a mouthed clacker made of an orange while she has her hair done. It's a man, of course, who's dressing her hair. Kichihei, the hairdresser. Here, can't you sti keep still? Never seen anyone move about as much as you. 
An apprentice is waiting on one side and says, Hey, Kichihei, I finished with the Yakko Shimada style, so give me a Hariuchi style, won't you? The Oiran Geisha said so. Another apprentice. And I'm after you. Another apprentice. What do you mean? I was here first. Kichihei, you girls are all the same. You girls are all the same. Bigger, bigger every morning. How about being quiet for a bit, eh? And in the hall, a fishmonger from Yamanoshiku has got his trays set out. Standing beside him is Bunsuke, a senior cook, who is wearing leg strappings. Genshiji, a kitchen hand, is there as well. Next to the central pillar in the entrance, Kizaimo, the proprietor, is giving his instructions, pointing with the end of his pipe. Fishmonger. Now, this is really fine mackerel, no doubt about it, sir. Namamugi is the only place you can catch them as big as this. Kizaimon. Would they do for a fish soup, Bunsuke? And then we have an image here in the text, in Kwaniki's translation, that's appeared in the original 1970, 1791 version of this. And Bunsuke replies, yes, hmm, all your shellfish are prawns, aren't they? You've got some good inshore flounders there, though. Fishmonger. They're fine fish, sir. Genshiji. Master, could you get some of the sea cucumbers? Fishmonger. They're from Enokido. Bunsuke. Let's have a few prawns, too. Kizaimon. Tell me, if you've got so many fish, why are they so expensive? Fishmonger. No good catches these days, sir. So they're not cheap. The clock strikes ten. In Yugiri's room on the second floor, all the juniors are now up. Kawatake, who's on duty, is wearing a large, worn-out old kimono with a fine pattern and purple coloring, a narrow black sash, and hanging loosely on top a rather scruffy padded kimono made of black crepe. The boxwood comb in her hair looks as if it was put in as soon as the tangles of the night had been brushed out, and seems likely to fall out before long. Being in charge of the juniors on the second floor here, she's just the type to get things organized. But now that the year's end is close at hand, she's the sort of courtesan that would not be out of place in a dumping ground for corpses. The juniors Ashikano and Yofune, the junior geishas, are both wearing deep green padded kimono that look like floor cloths used in oil shops and narrow sashes on, tops, on top. Their collars are black with dirt. Okay, so they're dirty, they're not wearing very fine uh, kimonos and their face powder is as patchy as snow left behind after a thaw. Yugiri is re reading a letter sent by a guest in answer to a request, a request she has made. Kawatake, who has just started doing some cleaning by herself, is stealing a look at, it, at the letter from behind with the broom in her hands. Together they look like a courtesan version of Kanzang and Jitoka. Okay, there's a note about that. They look like a mitate version of these two famous uh, figures from classical China. Read the note about that. Mitate is a very important uh, term in the uh, context of Edo aesthetics and Edo literature. I'll have a note about mitate, uh, sort of low, uh, uh, elegant version of something, analogic figure or metaphor is how I translate it usually. Uh, and these two geishas look like Kanzan and Jitoka. Yofune says, Those poem cards I couldn't find last night have just fallen out of the sleeve of my night clothes. Okay, the poem cards are, of course, uh, Ogura Hyakuninshu, the famous uh, po uh, collection of poems written by 100 poems, written by 100 uh, poets of the classical period. And I'll have another video about the, Hyak the Hyakunin Shu at a certain point. But they're playing this card game that has been very famous in Japan. It's still played today, and that's what they're doing here. It's a card game that has 100 cards with 100 poems by 100 different poets on them. Yugiri responds to her, There, I told you so. Kawatake, come on all of you, hurry up and have your baths. And then dust the alcove and the lattice work. Look, everything's just covered with dust. And it always smells there. While she is speaking, she picks up a handful of ashes from the brazier and tears up the remains of an old letter. She is just blowing at the brazier's edge when Yukino, an apprentice geisha, comes in. Kawatake. Yukino, can you go and see who's in the bath? Yukino. I just had a look and there weren't any outsiders. Kawatake. Yugiri, wouldn't you like to have a bath? Yugiri. 
In a minute. I've got something to think about at the moment. Kawataki. Ashika no. While I'm in the bath, get Yugiri, Yugiri's meal tray and mine ready. And boil up some tea and then, well, just get on with that for the time being. Yukino, fill me a rice bran bag to wash with. Get my yukata and come along with me. And then you can go around getting the kakitsuke. The meaning of kakitsuke is given in Shizu Hatte, to which this is a sequel, so I shan't append an e explanation here. Note here that Santo Kyoden's uh, is. This is this is not the narrator, right? So Santo Kyoden employs a narrator in this work, but this seems to be Santo Kyoden directly inserting this little explanation about his previous work. About so this is kind of metafictional almost, right? There's this breaking of the uh, fourth wall here. Um, in this sentence. The <clears throat> And, and Kawatake then continues her uh, lines. And I mean quickly, you'll be sorry if you don't get things finished. You're too kind to them, Yugiri, so they all shirk their duties, and it just won't do. With these, bar with these parting words, she goes off to the bath. As she leaves, she sticks a boxwood comb in the bun at the back of her head in order to style her hair. The haberdasher comes in next, with two or three ornamental hairpins in her hair, and a bag hanging from her shoulder. She peeps into the room and then takes an ivy pattern hairpin from her hair. Ah, you giddy, I've just had this hairpin made, but as it's a really good piece of tortoise shell, I was wondering if you'd like to have it. She shows it to you giddy, who takes it and examines it in the sunlight. My, this is a good one. I'm dying to have it, but we can't really discuss it now. So if it's still unsold tomorrow, could you bring it around, please? Haberdasher. All right, then. If I don't sell it today, I'll bring it for you tomorrow. If you send me back that bodkin you said you didn't like, I can let you have it for a small price. Bodkin, of course, is a tiny sword, uh, a word that British people like to use. It appears in Hamlet. Uh, bodkin, what's the... I forget. Hi. You, Giddy. How kind of you. A bear bodkin. Right, Hamlet calls it. Yugiri, how kind of you. At that moment, Kawatake comes back from the bath. You know that bodkin you sold me the other day? Well, it's got a crack in it already, Haberdasher. Let me mend it for you. Then Adazaki, a senior geisha, comes along from the rear of the second floor. Sorry, but you can't do this. Could you do this comb next? Please do it as quickly as you can, Haberdasher. Certainly. It looks more like the corpse of a comb, and probably got broken the previous night in a quarrel with a lover. A junior geisha comes in next. Isn't my ring ready yet? Haberdasher. It will be ready by tomorrow. It was to have your crest and your lovers combined, wasn't it? Junior geisha. Can't you keep these things quiet, you stupid woman? Her embarrassment causes the other juniors an amount of mirth. Haberdasher. I must go and see Uki Sato. Junior geisha. I know for sure Ukisato has still got a guest with her from last night. The haberdasher says thank you and goes through to the back. Meanwhile, in Yugiri's room, the junior geisha have been getting out the chopstick boxes and gold lacquer trays and setting out tea bowls. Steam is whistling from a kettle hanging over the brazier. They put some tea on top of a copy of Kogetsu nearby, pull out the drawers of the smoking set, and fill the, the, the tobacco pouches. Kawatake, Yukino, there's some money in the drawer of my comb box, the one that's locked, so could you get two shu and change them for some coppers? The key's in the drawer of the chest. Yukino gets her finger caught in the drawer. Ouch! And licks her finger. There's no key here. Kawatake, don't get in such a state. You put it there yourself last night, didn't you? She looks at a kakitsuke. An apprentice has brought her from the caterers marks the things she wants, and sends the apprentice to fetch them. Yofune, there were some sweet beans and some cyan pepper in the tea cupboard, weren't there? Could you bring them over here, please? Yugiri, why don't we send someone for some scallops and boil them up in their shells? Kawatake, why don't we? And then there's an image here from the actual original text from 1791 from the Diet Library's copy. 
And then Yugiri continues, What happened to the casserole? Kawatake. Someone broke it ages ago. Can't remember who. What's for breakfast? Ashikano. Ashikano. I'm sure it's fried bean curd and potatoes. Kawatake. Horrors. Horrors. Not horrors. Yugiri. I don't believe it. After discussing in some t detail what she likes to eat, Yugiri eventually eats up her morning bowl of rice and gargles for an unnecessarily long time before a couple of puffs of pipe before having a couple of puffs of pipe, and then goes straight off to her bath. Notice that the geisha smoke pipes here in this work and in the Edo period in general. An apprentice geisha follows her with her yukata. Now a draper from Tamachi comes in. Did you like the samples I sent you today? Kawataki, they're very nice, so let's settle for them. The draper, what about the undergarments? Do you still want? Kawataki, yes, they're to be made of the same pl plain cloth throughout, please. Oh, and this time, please make the apprentice's kimono a bit longer. The draper says, of course, and leaves. Kawataki calls him, back, calls him back. Oh, just a minute, please choose some material for that hakikake of mine as well. And then an authorial insertion here. A hakikake is this hemline at the bottom of a kimono and is a word peculiar to the pleasure quarters. Um, and please send me an overcollar in dappled purple cloth, Draper. Certainly. Just then an apprentice geisha comes in. Yasobe, the oiran wants you for a moment, Draper. And who do you belong to then? Kawatake, she belongs to Kurumai. The Draper goes to the back rooms. Yugiri soon comes back from her bath, wiping her ears on her yukata. Have you heard? Apparently, Guchi Sato's guest has been caught. Kawatake. That's what I heard. No laughing matter, is it? Yofune, would you go out? Would you get out what I need for my makeup? Yugiri. Ashikano, would you go and see if Okichi, the hairdresser, is on the second floor? Have a look in the sewing room, too. If she's not here yet, ask one of the Chiuro to go and fetch her, please. The Chiuro, here's another authorial insertion. The Chiuro are the servants who run errands for the proprietor's part of the establishment. This, too, is a word used only in the pleasure quarters, evidently. Kawatake. Yukino, go and get some tooth black. Blackening uh, geisha would blacken their teeth, tooth in the style of the uh, ancient Taeyan period, right? Uh, geisha would do this in the Edo period, but the style, uh, the custom goes back to the classical period. Uh, Yukino, go and get some black tooth and then go to the Kaedea with the credit book and get a stick of pomade, some neck, neck cream, some hair oil, pomatum, and some black filaments for my hair. Then get some rough paper and some tobacco. Yofune, get the brushes out, please. The brushes she asks for are for applying tooth black. Yofune gets out Yugiri's and Kawatake's mirror stands, and she arranges their vanity sets and hand basins. A mirror stand is a full-body mirror stand. Uh, in Japanese, I think the word is sugatami, right? We'll have to check the original on that. Yukino soon brings the tooth black she has brought and places it on the brazier. Yugiri and Kawatake rest their basins on their knees and begin by stirring their brushes around in the ashes of the brazier. Facing their mirrors, they apply the blackening. In the room opposite, a sake cup is standing in the alcove with an undergirdle tied around it. A waiting guest must have been trying to amuse himself. A junior is picking some coals out of a firebox with some hairpins and putting them in the brazier. Hana Uta. Come on, what do you think I should do? I'm so angry and annoyed I'm fit to burst. Itakoto, an oiran geisha, pulls over an inkstone box covered with odd grains of rice and, using paper bound like a book, gets down to writing a letter. But all the same, what can you say when you've got no proof? I should calm yourself down and keep your wits about you. Hanauta. But I know I've guessed right about what happened last night. From what she says, it seems that she has got wind of an affair between a guest of hers and another courtesan. At this point, a junior comes back from the latrine brushing her kimono. By mistake, she puts her hand on the pipe Hanauta has been smoking which has not yet gone out. Gibikawa. Youch, that's hot. 
Hanauta. You're such a careless girl. Gibika. I can't help it. I've got period pains. Do you know? I've just had my fortune told and my stars aren't good. What can I do? Things are just going to get worse. Hanauta. Didn't your ma come and see you a while ago? Gibika. She's gone home now. While Itako is busy writing her letter, Gyukichi, a steward, comes in. Let's have a cup of tea then. He pours some tea out and takes the tea bowl in both hands to warm them, at the same time sipping the tea while it's still hot. It's enough to drive you up the wall. I've been round to Nakanocho and they haven't got the money ready yet. Next settlement day I'm bound to be strung up by the neck so I'll look just like those monkeys people make by tying string around oranges. Things are bad when the credit doesn't get paid up. Gebika. I don't need you to tell me that. Gyukichi. You're only making fun of me because you don't care. You can make as much fun of me as you like, but you'll still be a virgin. Like I'm your first customer. Gebika smooths down her side locks with a comb of lacquered ivory. Oh yeah? What nerve? Gyukichi. What do you mean nerve? I'm shocked to hear of nerves. Gebika. You drink too much. If you're drunk, you ought to go down to the waiting room and sleep it off. Itakoto. Gebika, would you get me some paper for an envelope? And then please give the ironwork on the chest of drawers a polish. Gyukichi. Yeah, give it a polish. What's true of chemists is true of brothels. If the cabinets don't sh shine, nobody's going to give the place another look. Itakoto. Here, Gyukichi, could you address a letter for me later. It's got to be in a man's hand, you see. And then if anyone's going to Tamachi, let me know. I want some Sambyaku Gang bought from Jita, Jitambo, the chemists, Gyukichi says. Someone will probably go, be going and leaves. Itakoto. I meant to send some medicine over to Jito's for the pox, but it's too late now. Authorial insertion here. Homemade medicines for the pox are prepared on second floors everywhere. I learned the following secret formula, formula from, an, from an oedan geisha. It's too ridiculous for words, but I'll give it here anyway. Coptis japonica, licorice root, cloves, hawthorn berries, bambusa vici, wick, roast pickled plums, Chinese glue, pine cone kernels, three pubic hairs of a woman charred, Three spoonfuls heated up, to be used when all ten ingredients have been boiled up together. As for the three hairs being enough, that's a laugh. Itakoto. What's the date today, by the way? Hanauta. What is the date? Gebika. I don't know either. For a while now, various traders have been passing by, and the cries of each can be heard. Puppets for sale, Chinese type, Chinese puppets, mirrors polished, mirrors polished, primroses, primroses, primroses. Waya, waya, Gebika. Oh, if that's the waya man, it must be the twelfth. Oh, here comes a beggar priest. Come and have a look, Hanauta. He's quite a fine one, too. Hanauta. Which one? While she's standing up to look, he goes over to some street musician, so she takes a full-length mirror, a sugatami, and standing nearby and looks at the reflection through the latticework at the front. While she does so, a churo servant comes up from downstairs. I've been asked for some alms, so could you make a donation, please? He shows them the book to enter their donations in. Itakoto. How much are you meant to give? Chudo. A hundred mon will do, please. Itakoto. All right, I'll give it to you in a moment. Just then a maid servant comes in. I think there's a dish somewhere in this room, Miss Gebikawa. Could you look and see, please? Gebikawa. There isn't one. Maid servant. You always say that, all of you, but the lid of the dish you s dish was here a while ago. We're responsible, so if it's lost, we'll get into trouble. You're no blasted help at all. She goes, leaving that rebuke behind her. Gebika. Oh yeah, it's nothing to do with me. Just as she is brushing the incident aside, Uwa Kigi, a senior geisha, appears in the corridor looking rather odd. With a white silk headband and her teeth white without their blackening, she is a dreadful sight. She whispers to an apprentice, 
Go to the top shops and get me a tin perfume box and then go to the chemists in Shimonomachi and buy me a styptic and some silver foil. And on the way back get me some cotton from the sewing room. You'll have to be tactful about that. So it looks as though she is getting ready for the evening. That's Uakigi. Underline her name, she appears uh, below as well. Meanwhile, the laundry man has come from Minowamachi. The book rental man is pressing for books that have been lost. A traveling potter is exhibiting his wares. The messenger boy is t taking down the addresses for the letters. And a charcoal merchant is being made to take the blame for a bit of charcoal that leaped out of the fire and burned someone. Okay, so th these figures who are appearing now during the day are people who do not appear at the night in the pleasure quarters, of course. So uh, it's showing you a very different side of life in the pleasure quarters, in the demimonde. At the same time, the bath attendant is shouting to all on the second floor. The bath is closing now. In Yugiri's room, a lady hairdresser, Okichi, has come to do Yugiri's hair. While her hair is being done, Yugiri reads from a copy of Selected Tang Poetry. This is uh, the famous collection To Shisen in Japanese, Tang Shi Xiang in Chinese, which was extremely, extremely popular during the Edo period after Hattori Nankaku uh, imported the work. And um, a large swath of society was familiar with these poems. They were originally written in Chinese during the Tang period, but the game became very popular in the Edo period as a result of this book, the To Shisen, Selected Tang Poetry. Even prostitutes would read the book and would memorize the lines and so forth. Yugiri is reading from a copy of Tang, Selected Tang Poetry, which has kana added at the side, right? So there's the kanbun with the kana at the side without the kana at the side. Most of the uh, merchant class and the prostitute class would not be able to read it. And uh, she's reading the line, The road is as, is as straight as hair, and it is a peaceful spring day. Hell, come and light this pipe properly, will you? Okichi, are you still abstaining from salted foods, foods miss? Yugiri, no, that, f that finished the day before yesterday. Okichi, oh, that's good. Then a maid comes from the tea house, dabbing at her eyes with a bit of red silk. Excuse me, miss, but have you written on that fan yet? The guest who wants it keeps sending people to get it, Yugi. I wonder if he wants it for something special. Maid, just your name would do, miss. Yugi, yes, I suppose anything will do. I'll get it written for you. Maid, if you would, miss, and then she goes back. Okichi, you know, miss, the shinobu, shinobu style suits you much better than the tegara style of hairdo. Yugiri, all the same, whenever I have my hair shinobu style, I've always left grinding tea, so it brings me nothing but bad luck. Meanwhile, Kawatake has lit a pipe and gives it to Okichi. She's got greasy fingers, and so she holds it in a bit of paper to smoke it. Kawatake, Yukino, come and pour this away, will you? As she speaks, she puts a basin out. Inside it is some tooth black spittle, filling it four fifths full, and in the middle, two blobs of red spittle. There are scraps of paper, both thick and thin, in it too, and five or six lumps of tobacco ash. On the lattice work, some kimono have been hung up to dry. So too have some towels smeared with rouge here and there, and smelling of soap powder. Okichi soon finishes the hairdressing and goes outside, while Kawatake heads for the laboratory. Yugiri is left all by herself, squatting in front of the brazier with her face half buried in her collar. She looks worried about something. Some cedar wood chopsticks used as fire tongs smolder as they slowly burn away. The clock in the office strikes 12 noon. Yugiri takes a careful look around her and is about to stand up when a tea house boy comes up. Excuse me, miss, one of your gentlemen's arrived. Yugiri, really? I'll be along in a minute or so. Why don't you take Yukino with you and go on ahead? Boy, yes, miss, please don't be long. He leaves. Kawatake comes in. Yugiri, hello. 
Kawataki. Isn't it ridiculous coming on top of everything else? Yugi. Oh, what am I going to do? Kawatake. I've got a plan in mind, so don't you worry at all. Off you go then. Come on, Yofune. Let's have her kimono out. There's nothing Yugiri can do about the situation, so she changes her clothes. Her outer garment is of white silk, white silk with Genji clouds done here and there in purple, and among them flowers hand-painted in brilliant colors. The crest is rounded with stereo blossoms sewn in purple yarn. Her undergarments are made entirely of white damask, except for the hems, which are in plain hachijo silk. They have a pattern similar to that of her outer garments, done in colored silk thread. On top she ties an undergirdle of indigo damask with a lining of scarlet silk crepe. Then she turns to a full-length mirror and adjusts her clothing, adjusts her clothing. Even the stupidest procuress could realize that she looks like a 75 momme oiran, the highest rank, the most expensive oiran in a uh, brothel. Yugiri. Yukino, there's a guest still in Ukisato's room next door, isn't there? Yukino, yes there is. Yugiri. Go and ask them to lend me one of their kids to serve me some sake and tell them I said so. If you don't mind, Kawatake, now don't worry, Yugiri, I won't. Then someone brings in a sake bottle. Yugiri downs a teacup full in one go and thus fortified leaves the room. In the proprietor's room, Kizaimon is beside the hearth copying the Kanban Ita into the account book. A Kanban Ita is a board on which a temporary note is made of the amount each girl has made. The sign for three bu is san, mitsu, and for one bu, two shu, it's a line under a, over a triangle, and so on. Seeing Yugiri, he calls out to her, Good morning, Yugiri. So Yugiri, Yugiri gets, uh, goes up beside him. Thank you very much for what you gave me last night, sir. Kizaimon, the proprietor. I heard you liked them, so I had them brought up to you. What's on today? Someone on holiday? Yugiri. No, some guest at the Ukikusaya. Kizaimon. Just turn around a moment, will you? Well, I must say your hairstyle is a lot more elegant. I suppose your guests are waiting, so off you go. Yugiri. Goodbye. And she goes off to the tea house, taking an apprentice with her. Kizaimon watches her from behind. Yugiri's got more presence now, hasn't she? Wife. She has indeed. She's getting better and better. Now for the scene in the kitchen. The cooks are busy with their preparations and there's quite a din, what with the sounds of kamaboko being beaten flat, pulleys turning on the well, bowls breaking and rice being pounded. Lots of apprentices are sitting around a long table eating their lunch. Since the junior who takes the ember boxes around is there too, there's a senior apprentice geisha to serve her with tea at table. The flowers to adorn the food trays have been brought inside, and nearly a nearby a sake barrel has been fitted with a nap a tap. The smell of sake sauce assails the nostrils, and the steam is as thick as mist. A man comes into the proprietor's room, a hard drinker. Ever been to the baths at Mikawashima? Kizaimon. Yeah, I went only the other day. Drinker. Any haikai? Poetry? Kizaimon. In the evening I called a tea house girl over and made one about her. An amateur girl I took and made a real professional of her. That's how it went. What do you think of it, eh? Drinker. Yeah, I like the style. It gets you good marks, likely enough. While they are talking, in comes the mother of a courtesan who, it seems, has been sent home for a while because of illness. Kizaimon. Ah, oh, it's you, isn't it? Is it? How are things then, eh? Little better, perhaps? Mother. No change at all, I'm afraid, sir. Kizaimon. Well, that's a bit of a problem. She must get better soon. Mother. Yes. Kizaimon. Well, please have something to eat before you go. For some while, several beggars have been standing inside the shop blinds. Tendai mendicant beggar. 
南無沢はとトギャトバロギデオンサモラサンギバサンティン。キザイモン、Here you go, give him this. So saying, he throws over one mon. Next is a beggar. He is a sumo wrestler and Shidafuji Genta is his name. A ronin or masterless samurai. Fine may be the room in which you join your pillows, but perhaps one day you'll find you've parted once again. Kizaimon, what a racket! And he gives out some more money. Then the supervisor comes in. We're missing Skibana's apprentice geisha, so could you lend us one of yours, please? Wife of the proprietor. What happened to the one you borrowed the other day from someone in the neighborhood? Supervisor. She had scabies, so we had to send her back. Wife. Can't you hire one from someone we know? Supervisor. I can't think of anyone offhand, anywhere offhand. Kizaimon. You'd never get anyone for today. Apprentice through Geisha through the lattice. If anyone's going to the Kashibaya, I'd like some colored thread and some toothpicks. From what she says, she is probably on an errand for a courtesan who wants to offer a prayer to Kokagami for something. There's a note about Kokagami there. And again, on the same second floor at the back, a courtesan yells, Sababe, Sababe. Apprentice Geisha, yes, here I am, courtesan. Look, go to the Kaedeya, Kaedeya, and with those two shoe, get them to wrap up a hundred tobacco boxes in paper and tie them up with a special string, and come straight back without stopping for any street shows. This seems to be in return for a toko hana of about three dio. While the courtesan makes the whole corridor listen to what she is saying, in comes a junior geisha. Who was meant to be looking after the shamisen last night? The housemaids have been complaining because they can't find the plectrum. At that moment, at that moment, Yugiri comes back out of breath and puts her mouth to Kawatake's ear. Hello. I said I was in trouble and came straight back. What a business. Kawatake has just made the entry in the guest book. Kawatake. Well, that was a good thing to do, Yugiri. I've been in the fish tank place at the end of the road. Kawatake lowers her voice. Look, there will be lots more people about in the evening, so try to look as though you've, done, you've suddenly got a pain in the chest and go to the main room and rest. Yugiri. Even so, do you think it will all work out? Kawatake. I've been to see... I'll, I'm going to see everything works out all right. Keeping an eye on everybody else, she brings out the lover long since concealed in the cupboard and gets him behind a screen, cleverly avoiding people's attention. Okay, so here's her lover who's been hiding in the cupboard and this uh, will become the main plot line until the end of the work. This uh, affair between Yugiri and her lover, Izaimon. Now then, this lover is Fujiya's only son, Izaimon. And this love affair between Izaimon and Yugiri, as uh, uh, Koniki explains in his article, is well known to the Japanese at the time, so they would immediately know this story of these uh, ill-fated love, or not ill-fated, there's a happy ending to this. The readers are familiar with this story, this love affair between the two. Now then, this lover is Fujiya's only son, Izaimon. The love he and Yugiri felt for each other only led to difficulties as things developed, and he was soon disinherited. Okay, so he's disinherited. Uh, kanjo is the word in Japanese for disinheritance of a uh, son who uh, frequents the brothels too often. Out of love for him, Yugiri hid him in the back and then brought him up to the second floor, carefully avoiding discovery, and hid him in the cupboard. cupboard. Unfortunately, he was unable to come out, and all day she has had him hiding in there. As Izaimon went behind the screen, he trod noisily on a brush case, and this startled him as he had a guilty conscience. Yugiri, in a low voice, You must be ever so bored. It would have been too conspicuous for me to do anything, so I told other people what to do. Haven't you been hungry? 
Izaimon. Now, no, Kawataki came every now and then to see that I was all right, so I didn't get hungry. She had a good idea for a urinal too, putting cotton torn from a futong into a basin so as to not make any noise. So I had nothing to worry about at all. Yugiri gazes at his face as he speaks and then says, Everything's my fault, even the hopeless position you're now in. Please forgive me. And she clicks, clings to him tightly. While only a cricket can be heard chirping. Izaimon says, Rubbish. It's the same everywhere when you play around with girls. As long as you've got lots of money, the courtesans never show their sincerity. Sincerity is a key word here, underline it, it's the major theme uh, in this final section of the work. Sincerity. Does Yugiri show her have sincerity toward her lover or does she not? But for you to support me while I'm in this state shows the real sincerity in your heart. Then the clock in the office strikes 2 o'clock p.m. The courtesans are already lining up at the front to welcome guests and this sugakagaki suga suga is being played in the nakaomi mode. The second floor is quiet. For some while, next door in the room next to Ukisato's, the juniors Edomachi, Naniwa and Miyako have been playing Uta Gaduta. Yugiri. However much our feelings may be fulfilled, my hopes never are. There are always people watching, so I just put on a happy face like everyone does. But whenever I think of you, I just want to die. Okay, want to die, Shinju, the possibility of Shinju or uh, ritual suicide, that is the th major theme of Chikamatsu's puppet plays, appears here, right? Will they commit lovers' suicide or will they not? Edo Machi next door. Sanjo no in, if against my wishes I should stay long in this painful world. Okay, so they're playing this game Uta Garuta, which involves the Ogurda Hyakunin Shu uh, poems from the classical period, which became a card game with a hundred cards of a hundred po classical famous poems by a hundred different poets. And they're quoting these poems as they play this game. Uh, the other Mi the geisha playing this game, Miyako recites the her card I shall always remember the beautiful moon this night Naniwa Ah here it is Miyako can't you pick them up without scattering the cards all over the place Edomachi Izi Izumi Shikibu one of the famous poets of the Heian period has one of the card poems uh, on the card and she recites as something to remember when I shall have soon left this world Izaimon Okay, so there's two things, two uh, actions taking place simultaneous here, simultaneously here. The conversation between Izaimon and his lover Yugiri, the courtesan, and also this card game over on the side. And they're kind of intermingled in the text. Izaimon, how nice it would be if I could read the, rid of the sadness of being disinherited and come could come freely to the second floor here and meet you. Yugiri, to which Yugiri responds, Yes, when we used to meet every evening, we thought so lightly of it. But now that things are so hopeless, we've got a great deal more to worry about. Izaimon, yes, you're right. And then the girls playing the cards over on the side. Edo Machi quoting the card. Now I yearn for the times I then thought painful. Okay, so the card game the content of the poems in the card game is kind of emphasizing uh, or reinforcing the conversation that is taking place between Izaimon and Yugiri. Keep that in mind as you read this. Miyako, I'm sure it was somewhere around here, the card. Edomachi, there it is. Go on, pick it up. Fujiwara no Yoshitaka, the great Heian poet. I would have given even my life for you, she quotes. Yugiri, and now back to the conversation between you and Izaimon. On second thought, I'll live long and enjoy the pleasures of meeting you every now and then. Okay, so she wants to meet him more frequently, but she can't because she still has eight more years to serve in bondage as a geisha. To which you get uh, every now and then. 
To which Isaimon responds, yes, in death. Okay, again, hinting at the possibility that they will commit lover's suicide, Shinju, at the end. But they don't, of course. Yugiri, no flowers bloom. Isaimon, where there's life, Naniwa, the geisha playing the cards, quotes from a card, how long I want this to last. Edomachi, the other geisha, stop scrambling, can't you? Yugiri, to her lover. I've still got eight full years to serve as geisha. Miyako, and for how long you must surely know, quoting the poem, Yugiri, but what if, <clears throat> and then the geisha Edomachi, Ukon, you've forgotten and ignore this body of mine, though you promised, she quotes from the card, Yugiri to her lover, and when I think of it, I become really sad, to which Izaimon responds, and after this, and then Naniwa playing cards, would that we could meet even if it were the end of me, to which Yugiri responds, do you mean it, Izaimon? Hush, not so loud. Edomachi, uh, playing the card game, recites a poem, the noisy waves of the beach at Takashi, at, and then Miyako turns over another card, if I love you, my sleeves are sure to get damp. And then the narrator comes in. At that moment, the supervisor, Oyoko, cries, Now I know everything, and pulls aside the screen. I thought something strange was going on, and when I glanced around this morning, I caught sight of him there in the cupboard. But I pretended I'd seen nothing and kept on the lookout. And it's a dreadful state of affairs, just as I thought. How do you think I can get my job done if you treat me badly like this? I'm going straight to the master, and I'm going to tell him everything. Here, come on, you young fellows. Why don't you drag him out of here? Hearing her cry, up come the youths, each trying to outdo the others. A rain of clenched fists starts falling on poor Izaimon's head. With no thoughts for himself, Yugiri tears up and all, makes her way into their mists, midst and protects Izaimon. How cruel! Stop it, please, all of you! Izaimon's done nothing wrong! If you're going to hit him, you'd better start with me and beat me to death. Well, if you won't listen, uh, it'll have to be this. So saying, she lays her hand on a razor box on a mirror stand that happens to be nearby. The supervisor hurriedly stops her. Look, Yugiri, do you think I'm going to let you harm yourself when you're so valuable to us? Guess so she's stopping her from committing suicide with the razor. As she wrenches away what Yugiri has in her hand, the blade, all the men grab Izaimon by the hair and drag him out. At that moment, to the surprise of all, a voice comes from the long chest in the next room. Ah, Yugiri, you've shown the depth of your feelings. It's just like Oboshi in the tenth act of Chikamatsu's Kana de Hon Chu Shingura play, the famous play that all Japanese readers would be familiar with. Opening his, the lid. Opening the lid and leaping out, the man grabs the right arm of one of the youths and twists it, pushes another over with all his strength, kicks here, kicks there, kicks, 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 and kicks all around. He really seems to be enjoying it. On seeing this, the supervisor says, Oh, but you're Ukisato's guest. When? How? In there? He pays no attention, but holds up his hand in salute before Izaimon. You've never seen me before, so you're probably suspicious, but I do guard duties in the Kyoto branch, and my name is Hanemon. I came here on business, and when I met the master, I heard about your disinheritance. That took me by surprise, but since you're young and it was just a mistake on your part, it can't be helped. So please think things over again and apologize for making your father disinherit you, if you can. And then, as the lady Yugiri here is so devoted to you, we can probably get the red rope out. Okay. Uh, as she's... As long as she's got an upright heart, a courtesan won't cause you any trouble. Get the red rope out means to uh, purchase her, to buy her out of geisha bondage and uh, purchase her as his wife. So he's uh, uh, offering that solution to this problem and in order to, for them to avoid having to commit love suicide. 
And he continues, to find out if Yugiri's feelings are true or false, and then to redeem her and let you have a happy wedding. Well, since last month, I've been a regular visitor of Ukisato's in the next room, as a kind of spy, using the name Richigi. Okay, he's been a spy in order to find out the true nature of Yugiri's feelings toward him. <clears throat> and in order to disclose her re true self to him. Just to make sure of the facts, I stayed on today in her room. I gave instructions to the tea house and pretended to have gone home. Then, lucky enough to find a moment when nobody was about, I hid myself in the, this chest here and listened to what was being whispered behind the screen. And so I came to realize the depth of Yugiri's sincerity. So Yugiri passes the test. I'll see the proprietor, Yushidaya Kizaimon, later today and tell him about Yugiri being redeemed, in, order, in other words, uh, purchased out of geisha bondage. And here's the deposit you will need. Okay, so this problem between Yugiri and uh, her lover is resolved, and also the problem of you, uh, the lover being disinherited by his father will be resolved since uh, she will now be a proper woman, a wife to uh, him. He takes a wallet from his clothing and hands it over to Izaimo, who takes it and looks inside. Being more than twice as good as the stipend purse, it's made of brocade and contains the 500 ryo in full. Okay, so this is mirroring a scene that happens in Kanade Hong Chu Singura, right here. There is a letter with the money, and Izaimon opens it in wonder and reads, I hear that you have changed your mind, and so your disinheritance is revoked as from today. So it's a letter from his father. And there's no room, doubt, that it is in his father's writing. <clears throat> With words of gratitude and delight, Izaimon and Yugiri both join hands and prostrate themselves. As they do so, the clock strikes four in the afternoon. Before them, the sun is already beginning to sink. Okay, so we started early in the morning, or just before dawn, and we end now at uh, dusk, right? And then finally there is uh, some stage directions in the little box here. Now we'll return to the right side of the brocade. You can read about the glamour of the scene at night in lots of books. And then Santo Kyoden inserts this afterward, a postface, at the very end of the text. <clears throat> when you take a careful look from the great gate of Yoshiwara, the joys and angers, sadnesses and pleasures of the flowery world are just decorations on skeletons. Okay, so he's inserting a kind of didactic Buddhist message here at the very end to say to his possible censors and the government officials that although I describe the uh, goings-on of the pleasure district, this work uh, ultimately has a didactic message, so please don't ban it and please don't arrest me. This, the joys of this world are simply decorations on skeletons, as Onitsuda's poem has it. Okay. If you're deluded, delusion of course is a Buddhist term, to, all, to your eyes all is beautiful. If you're enlightened, however, in your nose all is smelly. Right? So the truly enlightened one, according to the Buddhist view, is someone who sees the beautiful phenomenal world as a mere corpse, as impermanent, as transient, and so forth. But be you deluded or enlightened, the lanterns of the tea houses lead from this world to nirvana, nehang, along life's road. Let everyone take care of himself, kanse, year three, in the Western calendar, 1791. First month, okay. First month is not January, it's the old lunar calendar, right? End story. Okay, so that's the end of the text. I will provide a second video about this work uh, in which I discuss all the things that are on the study guide, which I would distribute to you as well. 
Uh, that is all for now. If you have any questions, send me an email. Goodbye.